everybody, welcome to the 2021 Purdue University Jazz Festival. I'm Rex Richardson, I'm a trumpet player, and this is my clinic. So I thought I'd start off by playing something for you. I wanted to play one of my favorite blues tunes. This is by Thelonious Monk, a, a very famous composer you've probably heard of. And um, this is called Bowl of Our Blues. Now, what I'm, I'm going to pl play on a company, which is a bit unusual for a horn player, of course, but I think it's a really great way to practice. You really have to work on your command of the form, uh, keeping the chord changes, keeping the 12 bar, you know, the, the integrity of that 12 bar blues form, and uh, working on time as well. So often I'll try to push my limits and try to play stuff, you know, <laughs> see if I can kind of uh, put myself in a bind and see if I can get out of it rhythmically or harmonically. And uh, so let's, let's see how it goes. Okay, so normally in a live clinic when I'm interacting with folks, I, I ask if anyone noticed anything unusual in terms of the techniques I employed. And that's usually a chance for us to get into a discussion about circular breathing and the use of multiphonics. So circular breathing, of course, is when you, you take a breath while you're playing, so you don't have to actually pause and take a breath. And then multiphonics are used, um, that really refers to humming another pitch while you're playing. And so you can do that a couple ways. One is you can use something that's not very distinct and that's essentially a growl. Um, in this case, so it is sometimes hard to hear with this kind of miking, a little easier to hear in the room. I'm, I'm playing one pitch and, and trying to sing a very um, precise into interval um, with that pitch so that it might produce what they call a resultant tone, which is essentially creating a third or fourth note in addition to, the, to that of being sound and so it creates a chord. So anyway, um, I was using that if, if you notice something weird. Um, however, those techniques are probably beyond the scope of this clinic. I will tell you I've got this 100 days of practice series on YouTube and I do have um, a couple of videos dealing with both circular breathing and multiphonics if you're interested. But now looking beyond the extended techniques used in that performance. Um, I want to use that performance as, as maybe a launching point to talk about, you know, how we develop skills generally. The ideas are, that, you know, having to do with 
what skills we need to develop, how do we figure that out. And I think it comes down to, if you think of two very broad principles, one is, you know, modeling, getting a sense of who you want to sound like, what you want to sound like on your instrument. I've never known anyone who just sort of, they started playing, they didn't listen to any other trumpet players or saxophones or whatever your instrument is, and they just sort of figured out how to make a, a beautiful sound. Um, that doesn't tend to happen by accident. It tends to happen through pretty careful study, careful modeling, getting a pretty clear idea of what your instrument is supposed to sound like. So it starts with that, um, understanding what are the goals, very broadly speaking, what do you want to sound like? And the next step is, what are the skills we have to develop in order to achieve those goals? You know, if you're checking out Winter Marsalis or Tina Tinghelseth or, or your favorite trombonist or saxophonist or pianist or whatever you might be listening to, um, you want to get a pretty clear idea of what the difference is between what they're doing and what you're doing. If you just hear them go, oh, I don't know, they sound great and I don't. Well, that might be true. But it's not very helpful. It's not, uh, it's not the most useful observation for you. You're looking for details. You're looking for specific qualities in the playing that you want to try to pull into your own game as a player, your own vocabulary, your own set of techniques. So in other words, most broadly speaking, what are the goals? What do you want to sound like? And how do you get there? And you can make that down too, right? You should. The idea of uh, understanding what skills actually make for a great trumpet player, trombonist, or saxophonist, whatever your instrument is. And how do you get there, having a roadmap for, for practicing? And we, we all need to keep in mind, I mean, any of you who have any seriousness about your music, and that's probably all of you because you're watching this video, right? I'm sure you've been told, you gotta practice, you gotta put a lot of time in, in your instrument. And that's true, but really what's more important than time is having a clear plan. So you can manage probably less time practicing if you have a really clear idea about how you're practicing. If you have a, a good plan and you're very efficient than if you're just spending hours a day on an instrument. And this is an important point. So this is, of course, a jazz festival. <clears throat> so let's talk about jazz skills. How, how do you study jazz? How do you try to get uh, more proficient as a jazz musician? And I've, I've come to think of the study of jazz as separable into three distinct but overlapping areas. One is music theory. So it's basically anything that covers the nuts and bolts of the music. And in fact, you can put history in there too. You can think of it as sort of maybe a little more the academic side of the music where it comes down to understanding pitch organization that scales, chords, scale chord relationships, the form of tunes, um, knowing the history, knowing who played with whom, who was an innovator, what, how the music developed, right? Um, now, it's, it's another area is that of transcription. And this is where you really figure out what sounds good. The theory doesn't tell you all that much. You know, it gives you an idea of how the music, music is put together. You can, uh, one way to think about pitch organization is um, there's this chord, C7, very commonly used chord, and in most cases, this mode, C mixolydian, will work with that chord. That's, again, that's not the only way to think about organizing pitches, but um, it's, it's a very common way to do it, right? Um, that's great, that gives you the mechanics. It doesn't really tell you what sounds like jazz. You learn that through transcription, that is, listening to and analyzing um, the, the playing of, of great players. So, um, but one thing that's very important is that the theory helps you to figure out what you're listening to. The theory, the nuts and bolts of the music, helps you to analyze what it is that you're transcribing. Transcription projects can range from anything from just stealing a lick. You know, I'll do this every other day. It seems like I'm listening to Mike Brecker or Chris Barter, one of my favorite jazz artists. I just grab a lick, something to add in my vocabulary and kind of mess with change around a bit and then it becomes something kind of my own, you know. Or it can be a huge project like transcribing entire big band charts, you know. Um, or what's most common for jazz musicians, if you stay with it long enough and you're serious, is transcribing entire solos. So you're, you're getting vocabulary, you're getting licks, you're also getting a sense of architecture in terms of like how
jazz musicians put together an entire performance on a particular tune. Um, now, the third area is something, it, it's so obvious that people don't always mention it, it's actually improvising. You have to do a lot of improvising. So you can talk about theory for days and you can listen and copy you know, for, for hundreds of hours, but if you don't spend a lot of time improvising, you're not going to become fluent in the art of improvisation. It just takes um, a lot of time so that you get a sense of flow. It's very similar to um, learning a new language, a uh, verbal language, you know, uh, what we normally think of as language as opposed to musical language. So in other words, if you're say you're studying Japanese or Portuguese or whatever the language might be, um, yeah, at some point you need to dig, dig into syntax and grammar and of course vocabulary, but you need to do a, a lot of listening to native speakers. You get the sound in your head, and also you need to learn how to converse. You can have those first two areas, the grammar and the vocabulary and the sound in your head, but if you're not actually conversing, um, you're not going to get conversant. You're not going to become fluent in the language. It's the same thing with jazz improvisation. And this can also be divided into two areas. You're going to learn certain things when you're in the practice room, working on things on your own, and other things when you're playing with other musicians. Playing with other musicians not only is it kind of the point of what we do most of the time, you know, especially horn players. I mean, it's very rare that we'll perform without another musician. But it's also uh, it's so much fun. That's why we do it. So many of us are involved in band programs at high school or uh, college or, or whatever, you know, community bands, because we're going to make music with other players, right? So this is crucial. But if you're really trying to become a great jazz musician, you have to make sure that what you do when you're playing with other musicians is part of your learning process. You're going to learn different things about how to structure a solo, how to deal with time, how to deal with space. So the way I played on that blues, for example, Man, I was, I was not leaving any space at all, really, right? Because I was kind of being the rhythm section as well as the soloist. Most of the time, if I'm playing with the rhythm section, I leave a lot more space. It just makes a lot more sense musically. So again, these three areas, the theory, transcription, and improvisation, distinct but overlapping. And I've got um, some documents I want to submit um, that you can look at that has a little more details about each of these areas of study to help you if you're trying to really improve what you're doing as a jazz musician, help you kind of um, create a bit of a roadmap for your study. Okay, so let's talk about how to practice uh, some of these skills on, on the jazz side. <clears throat> so, on, on the, in the area of theory, um, one of the most important things you need is simply a, a great reference book, in my opinion. So. This is probably my favorite. Mark Levine's The Jazz Theory Book. Got a great title, very easy to remember. <clears throat> and what it does is it's <clears throat> started to codify the way that jazz musicians think about um, the, the form of the music. Scale and chord relationships. Um, how you use chromaticism, all these kind of things, which are very important, of course. And once you have an understanding of this, then you can start doing some specific, um, it takes certain specific approaches to practicing. So before, I, of course, I performed that blues on the company. So I need to have a certain command of the form to do that, right? And this is something that all horn players should strive for. Um, rhythm section players tend to acquire the skill much more thoroughly than we do because it's a matter of survival for them. If you're playing with a, a bassist or a pianist or guitarist or, you know, who can't play the chords, it's going to be pretty obvious and painful to play with them or a drummer who just has no sense of time or, and, and can't keep the form. Horn players tend to skate over the form though and that's something we should learn not to do. We should try to be musicians on the same level as a rhythm section player. So, one of the things you can do is, if we go back to the blues form, and you understand, well, here are the chords, and here are scales I can play over this chords. And you should never think of it as like, well, these are the only notes I can play, but it's a way of sort of a baseline kind of infrastructure for the pitch organization, if that makes sense. Um, you choose a set of 
of uh, scales, and then you run through this in within the, the harmonic rhythm of the form. And so I'll give you a little demonstration of this on B-flat blues, and I'll include, I'll include the um, I'll include a chart uh, with this in among the handouts. Okay, so of course the circuit breathing is optional. You know, you can just leave little breaks when you, whenever you need to take a breath. But hopefully you can hear the chord progression. You can hear the changes basically just playing these this, this set of modes over the chords. So another way to approach this is more vertically. You can play uh, the arpeggios rather than the modes. And here's an example of that. So this exercise is again about helping to establish your command of the form. These are not necessarily things you'd play when you're improvising. No, you might play a, a, a bit of a mode or uh, an arpeggio here and there, but these are not really models for improvisation. So an exercise that starts getting you dealing with very simple improvisation and is also working with the form is to play bass lines. So you figure this out by, you know, once you know how the chords work, the basic structure, and if you listen to some bass players and actually transcribe some bass lines, see what, what do they play? Well, most of the time, as a starting point at least, um, you're dealing with uh, the basic elements of the chord structure. Uh, the triads, one, two, three, five, three, you know, scale, scale degrees. And you start to Remove, you're not dealing with the rhythmic element of improvisation because you know you're pretty much just playing quarter notes, but you are dealing with very simple melodic improvisation. Again, not necessarily something you'd want to do in a solo, but it starts getting you improvising in very simple terms on the form. So here's an example of that. So, mm -hmm. that you're probably not going to do on stage, but again, a useful practice tool for, for learning a particular skill, and that is really trying to master the form. So you can, you can apply this to any kind of a tune, so any standard tune you're working on. If you understand how the harmony works and what the chord changes are, and what scales and modes you can use to associate with these chord changes, you can practice form, you can internalize form. And then, it's not that you're going to be performing often unaccompanied, it's not so much the point, is that you have the same command of the form as a good rhythm section player, which means you're, when you play together, you're equals when it comes to that skill. And that gives you a lot more musical freedom, you know, to really kind of push the boundaries and create some more exciting improvisation. So that's really what that's all about. So, um, of course, there are a million things you can, you can practice for improvisation, and a lot of that is just beyond what the scale I think this, this video is supposed to be. But a few things I practice is I'll take tunes through 12 keys. So once I have this skill together in, in terms of understanding how the chords work, how the chord scale relationships work, I can do this kind of practice like I just demonstrated on any kind of a standard tune and then I can take it through 12 keys. I can improvise on the tune in each of the 12 keys. Um, I can just take a particular mode of scale and work out on it, just trying to find all these different patterns and trying to find melodies that sound good, you know. Um, I'll work on licks to play over 251 changes, which I'm sure all of you have heard of, and maybe I'll, you know, take someone from, or, or take something from a recording or kind of discover one myself, which is usually derived from something someone else has done, but maybe change a little bit. And then, not necessarily so that I'll use it in all keys 
Uh, it's not always how the improvisation works, but I'll practice it in all keys so that I'm becoming more, I'm getting more fluidity to my take, more technique, more, more uh, fluency in the, the 12 keys. So it's really important to do that. So there's, there's this whole set of things you can practice with jazz improvisation. Transcription. I mean, it starts with, you You know, you don't have to start off transcribing a Clifford Brown solo or a Mike Brecker solo if you're a saxophonist. Um, start off checking out things that make sense to you. And if you're a brand new transcriber, those guys are maybe not the place to start. You know, if you listen to, the, to pop music or even if you listen to hip hop, grab some riff. Sometimes it's like a, a flute riff or, or some kind of a horn line or even something from a keyboard. If you can hear it, it makes sense to you. Try to figure out how to play it. All this counts as transcription. Now, if you want to become a really good jazz musician, eventually you're going to have to get into that kind of jazz transcription, transcribing solos and maybe bigger projects like transcribing charts. You know? But you shouldn't necessarily start there, right? And again, when it comes to improvisation, you're trying to apply all these skills. You're working on, you're working on uh, improvising over tunes, improvising on a scale. You're maybe improvising freely, you know. You get certain skills you're going to develop in the, in the practice on your own. And again, make sure when you're playing with, with other musicians that part of what you're aiming for is to develop other skills. You're trying to apply what you've done in the practice room, and then you're learning how to put solos together with other people, how, how to make everything work in, in a larger format. And so um, that's, in a nutshell, some suggestions I have for for practicing jazz. And next I'm going to get into a little more brass specific information. Okay, so I mentioned brass specific skills, but really initially this is not so much about brass instruments, it's about any instrument. You need to figure out what skills you need to develop. So you can break it down. For us on the on the brass side, you can think of in terms of sound, probably the most obvious, right? Having a great sound. And you can tie this to breathing, you know, having good breathing skills. This varies from instrument to instrument. For tuba players, they need to learn to move a lot of air. And among woodwinds, it's the flute players. It's kind of strange pairing. You wouldn't associate tuba players and flute players uh, necessarily, but in terms of the breathing, they have a lot of similar challenges. Trumpet players, really for us, unless you're not breathing at all, it's pretty easy to get enough air. The problem is that it's, a, it's also easy to create tension, excess tension when you're breathing. So you're trying to be both both energized and relaxed in your breathing. So you, you want to be active in your breathing, but avoid excess tension in your shoulders, in your in your neck. You want to be as unmuscular as possible when you play. Um, so all that ties breathing and sound. Next we have, for trumpet players, finger technique, something very important, right? Uh, for trombone players, it could be slide technique. For for all brass players, articulation is important. And so some of these things can be broken down into smaller categories, right? Like for articulation, single tongue, um, double tongue, triple tongue. You all presumably play some jazz, so you want to be able to work on your jazz articulation. Obviously, it's not quite the same. You don't articulate the same way in concert band or in jazz band or in the orchestra and jazz band. Um, and also, you should, I think, practice K-tongue, which is the second syllable of double tongue and the second or third syllable of triple tongue. All these things are things that you can practice, right? What else do we have? Well, flexibility. Um, that is generally the ability to move around the range of the instrument with, with ease, right? We can have specific exercises based on lip slurring to develop that. Our range. Everyone's excited about range, at least trumpet players, right? But we have to be able to play equally well on the low register, the middle register, and the high register. And I'm not talking about the extreme high register, that's something pretty specialized. But you need to have a healthy high register as well as middle and low register before you can even think about trying to be a, a, a screamer or a, a super specialized lead player, right? At this point, all of you should be really trying to develop a broad set of skills. So that kind of covers it in a nutshell. There are also other skills that, that are more, uh, you know, common to all musicians. Being a good reader, knowing your scales, you know, you need to be comfortable playing in different keys. For trumpet players and some other instruments, we need to become good at transposition. So having this set of skills and realizing, wow, this is what I need to work on, that's really the starting point. 
So one of the things brass players always talk about when uh, working on the sound is doing long tones, right? Well, long tones can be pretty dull. One of the reasons for that is we sometimes we'll play a long note and not really have any kind of a goal. I guess perhaps you're trying to listen to see if your sound is good, but I think it's better to be a little more active with your long tones. One way to do that is to play bending tones because one of the problems brass players face is we tend to sit above the center of the pitch. We can move the pitch around all over the place, right? It's a certain kind of flexibility we have, and that can be both a good thing and a bad thing. When it's a bad thing, it's when you're unintentionally sitting high on the side of the pitch, like where the instrument's not really designed to resonate. And the sound's a little bit tight, and it doesn't project. It's not your best sound, and it, it it's also hard to play that way. So one thing you can do is play bending tones. Would you say, on, if you're talking about the trumpet, you start on G in the staff, so it's concert F, and you simply bend a half step down, and then you finger the note. So when you're bending the note, it's going to be distorted because it's not the actual pitch that, you know, it's not the right length, for the, uh, the, the pitch is not right for the length of the instrument that you're playing, it's not one of the overtones. But then when you finger the note you're bending to, it should pop and be really centered and right in the pocket. And then when you release the finger, keep the pitch set, go back up, you should find that your sound is more centered. And you can kind of find the sweet spot by bending it. And ultimately, you kind of want to train yourself into playing in this, that sweet spot all the time. Okay, so another area of, of expertise we need to develop as trumpet players, at least specifically, and this would apply to horn players as well, is of course finger technique. So most of us know the Clark Technical Studies book is probably maybe the second most popular book among brass players after the Arbenz uh, method for cornet, which is also applied to other brass instruments. But it's a great book. I highly recommend it. Uh, many people know the second study, the very dull ya da 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 da. Not the most fun stuff to to play, but it, it can be very very useful for getting your finger technique together. So look, if you're working on fingers, if you know the pattern really well, don't do it in F. All right, that's what everyone loves to do. It's very easy. If you're not really training your fingers, move it up a half step and an F sharp. All of a sudden. You've got some challenges there, right? Also, I can use this exercise to work on several skills at once. So obviously we're dealing with fingers to start with, but I can also say, well, I'm going to do it slurred. I'm also going to do it single tongue. I'm going to do it double tongue, triple tongue. I also do it K-tongued, which is very difficult to, to make sound good. And I use it to, to work on jazz articulation as well. So you can take one exercise and and, and apply it to a, a number of skills. So first, um, here it is, reasonable tempo normal. I do it in a metronome with, with a metronome, but I'm just trying to do it, just kind of do a quick demo here. I'm doing it in F sharp in a reasonable tempo, slurred, and my goal is to have everything to be very connected, to play with really good time and really good fluidity with my technique. Okay, next I'm going to do it single tongue, and I'm trying to not worry so much about a real staccato approach. I'm trying to keep it fairly connected. Da 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 da. And and what I'm aiming for is to get the same kind of fluidity, or as close to the same fluidity I can get as I can, um, trying to emulate my slurring. I'm just trying to put a front to the note, so I want everything else to be the same, for it to be really. Uh, connected, consistent, with good time, um, and have the same sound quality as well.
Okay, so the next way to articulate is a pretty tough one. It's K-tonguing. So what is K-tonguing? Well, if you don't double tongue and triple tongue in, I wouldn't worry about this, but if you have learned to double tongue and triple tongue, then it's basically that ka or more accurately off my ga syllable you're using as a second syllable for double tonguing and the second or third syllable for triple tonguing depending on how you tend to do it. So for me, I use it as a third syllable and say da da ga 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 da at more of a typical speed. And for for double tonguing, da ga da ga da ga da ga da. So what's unusual is to practice isolating that k syllable. They call it k, but I I really rarely use a hard ka or k kind of sound. I tend to use a little bit of a softer syllable. It seems to work better for having more tone. So it'd be in the case of this exercise, my syllable would be ga 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 ga. It sounds silly when you sing it, and it's very hard to make it sound great. So you're you're just trying to get it to sound as close as possible to your single tongue. My number sounds exactly that by like my single tongue, but I'm trying to get it as close as possible. And the reason to do this is that it makes my double tongue and triple tongue much more consistent and much more fluid. If um if I'm not practicing that, I'm likely to have a little bit of a hitch where the, the K tongue is weak, and that makes a lot of the double and triple tongue passages more difficult to play. And even if they're not difficult to play, it tends to it tends to allow for a certain kind of unevenness in the tonguing. So this is one way to counteract that is to focus on that under the uh, overlooked uh, syllable, really, the K syllable, which we tend to overlook when it comes to our double tongue and triple tongue. So here it is. Here's my, <laughs> my best rendition for right now, anyway, of uh, Clark second study in F sharp K tongue. <laughs> same exercise double tongue and I've got the same set of goals here I'm trying to achieve fluidity and consistency really I'm trying to emulate at this point I'm trying to emulate my single tongue because let's face it most of us are going to play our best when it comes to articulation single tonguing at a comfortable tempo right so ideally your double tongue and triple tongue and your k-tongue will all sound like that so I should have mentioned that too when k-tonguing I'm trying to emulate the sound of my single tongue. With double tongue, with this exercise, I'm not going at full double tongue speed because, well, double tongue you fast, triple tongue you fast, it's, it's fairly easy to do that. What's not so easy is to get uh, the same kind of quality of sound and consistency as when you're single tongue. So I'm doing it slowly and I'm focused on those same, those same ideas of fluidity and consistency and really good time. So here it is, double tongue. Okay, now next is the really tricky one. <clears throat> you can do this exercise triple tongue. Yeah, it's counterintuitive because it's a duple, uh, it's a duple exercise. <clears throat> If you triple tongue, etc. Um, it's rhythmically awkward for sure, but it, it gets easier. You um, you can start off thinking in terms of triplets. <clears throat> and, et cetera, right? Um, I, I'll include uh, a, a handout that has the, the triple tongue pattern for this exercise if you want to do it this way. If you can't do it this way, don't worry. You can still practice your, your triple tongue with this exercise very easily. I'll, I'll show an example of that afterwards. But here it is, triple tongue. Now, normally I do all of these exercises three times through because that's what I have to do with the triple tongue for the patterns to line up again. Right, so that the initial down beats and uh, uh, line up with the initial ta <laughs> of ta ta ka. So if that makes sense. So here it is. Um, my triple tongue rendition of 
Clark said could study an F sharp. So if you find that approach a bit frustrating, as I did when I started doing it, so please don't think that I, I, I could just do that. I had to take my time. Again, initially thinking in terms of triplets, da da ga da da ga da da ga da da ga da, etc. Check out the handout that, that I've included to show you those patterns. Um, if that's difficult, initially just, you can still practice your triple tongue, this idea that you're hitting all these different areas of your technique, your articulation technique with this exercise. You can still, do that if this approach to it is awkward. And you simply triple tongue and eight snow. Etc. So here's a little demonstration of that. Now last but not least would be jazz articulation. So what does one mean by jazz articulation? And that's a, it's a good question because articulation, especially on the jazz side of things, is very personal. You'll find different jazz musicians have a different way of approaching it. And if you're a trumpet player, you want to check out, you know, as many of the, the, the great historical jazz trumpet players as you can to see how were they articulating. So if you listen to, say, to Louis Armstrong, uh, Louis Armstrong, Miles Davis, Clifford Brown, Freddie Hubbard, Dizzy, they all have a different sound of their articulation, right? Clifford tended to tongue, to do a single tongue in a very fast tempo, faster than what most people would do. Um, Freddie Hubbard tends to use um, what they, they also often call, I believe, cross-tonguing, a lot of people call it that, which is your tonguing on the, the weak beats. So for in the case of this exercise, it would be da da yi da yi da yi da yi da yi da, and that's a pretty typical way of approaching bebop style articulation. It's what I'm essentially using in that blues performance. So in the slower moving eighth notes, I'm tending to put a, a light tongue on most of the notes and slur some of them. A lot of the notes may be there somewhere in between. In between. There's not a clear distinction between slurring and tonguing, which is something we generally do not aim for, of course, in classical music. We Most of the time, we want a clear delineation between tonguing and slurring. It's not necessarily required for jazz. Jazz articulation is really about feel and about facility. So the patterns you use should help you to get the right swing feel or straight eighth feel, whatever, the, whatever style you're playing. It's got a groove and has to sort of sit in the beat a certain way. And your articulation helps you to do that. It also helps you to execute difficult passages. So some things are really awkward to slur, other things are awkward to tongue, but with the right combination of slurring and tonguing, you can often make it quite playable. So um, that's how to think about jazz articulation. Probably the most standard approach is, is I'm using here, Freddie Herber's approach of tonguing on those weak beats. And um, so I'm also trying to keep everything very long, so you're not going to hear a Da da yi da yi da yi da yi. It's more like da da yi da yi da yi da yi da yi da. So it all it's again somewhere between tonguing and slurring. Um, and when you're doing it in context while performing, you almost want everything to sound like it's very very lightly and smoothly tongued all the way through. So here's a jazz articulation edition of Clark's second study in F sharp. So hopefully you can hear the resemblance between that articulation and what I was using on the, in the performance of the, the blues. Now, something else that comes up a lot is as people are, are working on these, these skills is you realize that I'm not really getting that evenness between my the sound quality and the execution of the single tongue, K tongue, double tongue, and triple tongue. So I came up with this little, little uh, exercise that I find really helpful just playing 16th notes back to back and switching in the middle, trying to match it. So I'm going da 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 da
So I'm going from single to K to double tongue and triple tongue um, without a break and trying to see if I can make it as uniform as possible. This is really a, a great exercise. Don't try to do this fast at first. Go very slowly. Go as slowly as you need to. With all these exercises, I should point out, I think it's a great idea to you get them working in terms of the, the, the tonguing technique, the, the finger technique. Mostly you don't need to think about the mechanics, but you want to make sure you have a really clear idea of the sound, that, uh, you know, what you want to sound like as you're doing it. And then you get it in your fingers, you get it in your chops. When this is working, that's the time to pull out the metronome for things that, that are aimed at, at speed or for which you, you're really trying to train for your consistency. Pull out the metronome once you have the technique under control. Before that, it might not help you. If you're like, well, I'm just trying to get the basic execution of this exercise together, maybe the metronome won't help. For example, getting that jazz articulation together or working on okay K-Tongue, just getting it to, to, to speak for you. Wait until it's working, then the metronome is one of your most important tools because not only because it helps you play with good time, but it, it allows you to gauge your progress. Anything that is speed-based in terms of success and finger technique and flexibility and tonguing, all of those have really rely on your, your achievement with, with speed uh, for success. The metronome allows you to gauge your progress there. So here's that exercise. Single, K, double, triple, four beats each, back to back. Okay, so this is another exercise. That, that is previous exercise can be a bit frustrating at first, but take your time with it. Go slowly, get that K tongue sound the way you want it to. Uh, that'll help get you a double tongue and triple time more consistent. So I want to move on to another area of expertise. We're not going to cover everything possible here because we just don't have time, I think, for the format of this clinic. But one of the most important areas of skill for a brass player is flexibility. As I mentioned earlier, flexibility, broadly speaking, well, most broadly, it, it can refer to your adaptability in, in any, any setting, you know, in terms of range, articulation or, or styles, you know, but um, in this case, flexibility in, in terms of a technique also refers to how easily you can move across the range of the instrument. There can be different kinds of flexibility even within that zone. Um, I tend to rely on lip slurring to develop flexibility so that I can move quickly between partials. Um, you can also use wider interval uh, exercises. You can also move up and down the entire range of the horn, or at least a, a, a wide part of the range of the instrument. So here's an exercise I've been doing since I was 14 years old. Before this point, my flexibility was terrible. I could barely slurp from the C to an E in the staff. I was a very muscular trumpet player, and that is a terrible thing for brass players. Muscle is the enemy when it comes to to play an instrument. So, hey, develop your muscles if you want. Go to the gym, but just don't use them to play the, the trumpet or any brass instrument, really any musical instrument, right? So, except maybe carrying your bass or your tuba around, but not when it comes to playing a brass instrument. So, yeah, it's it's very simple. I've included a chart uh, with this as, as well for one of the handouts. And um, you start, I, I've got the metronome here. You hear it's a little bit out of sync because the sound is not hitting the microphone at exactly the same time. The sound of the microphone, that is, and uh, sorry, the sound of the metronome and the sound of the trumpet, but you get a sense of what's happening. I'm doing this at quarter note equals 100. Start with quarter notes, go to eighth notes, take a break. If that's all you can do at first, don't go any faster. If you can go faster, you can get into 16th notes, six tuplets, and even 32nd notes. But initially, like I mentioned before, only use a metronome when you feel like you've got the basic mechanics happening. When you can make the slurs happen smoothly, going right to the center of each note with a really good connection in between the notes. Then you're ready to find a nice, relaxed, slow tempo, put it on the metronome. Remember, you can hear this and think, you know, how could I ever do this? Well, if I can do it, anyone could, because like I mentioned, my flexibility was terrible. I was using every muscle in my upper body to, to, to play simple slurs on the instrument. And I, I learned how not to do that with, thanks to my teacher, Dennis Edelbrock, who taught me this exercise. 
because he got me to relax my hands so I wasn't so tense on the instrument, and then simply doing this exercise. Now the way I've done it here, I'm doing it starting on G in the staff and then C in the staff. But ultimately, you can do it across the whole range of the instrument. So you can start on G in the staff, C in the staff, E in the staff, G at the top of the staff, and so on. And I always wrap up, I didn't do it here just for the sake of time, but I always wrap up by going uh, starting the exercise on low C. Another way to practice this is you don't have to stay in the open position. So you can do a different position every day. If you had a daily routine of flexibility exercises, you could do it open the first day, second valve the second day, or second position if you're playing a uh, slide, etc. You can do it seven days a week and it lines up nicely, right? Or you can end up doing it every day, you know, every other day, whatever works for you. It takes a little bit of experimentation. But start where it's easy, both in terms of tempo and range, and gradually build from there. So here's the exercise. So I want to point out for the trumpet players who tend to be, all of us tend to be a bit high note crazy, right? Um, flexibility exercises are a great way to develop a healthy high register. Um, you, one of the reasons why it works is because you can't really use muscle. You have to have everything in balance and only the muscles that are really supposed to be working are working. Any other muscles that are flexing tend to get in the way. and so. In that sense, it's a great way to train yourself to get into the upper register without using too much physicality. So, for example, if you're starting on G and the staff and going to C and E and G, and sort of the higher you go, of course, you know, if, if you can control it and do lip trills on that range, you can have a great command of that register. So the goal is to, to gradually expand that. And always root things in the low register too, you know. So with more time, I could I could demonstrate more of these exercises, and we could talk about other other areas uh, to dig into. But we hit some of the basics. Um, we covered to recap a bit. We covered some of the the ways to practice jazz. Again, thinking in terms of three distinct but overlapping areas: theory slash history, transcription, and improvisation and finding really smart ways to apply all that practice uh, when it came, comes to instrumental studies. And, and remember, if you're really into jazz, or you feel like, man, I'm just a jazz player, you, you probably shouldn't be thinking that way yet, especially if you're in high school. Um, none of us should really be specialists in, in high school. Um, most of the great trumpet players I know, people like, like Winton, certainly, and even... Ryan Kaiser, these, these guys who became renowned as jazz players. Winton, of course, was, was a classical recording artist, but even Ryan Kaiser was really something of a classical virtuoso before focusing on jazz later in his career. Um, this is something that really should apply to all of us. When you're in high school, really work on mastering your instrument. Now, it's not to say you can't study jazz as well. Ideally, you're making that a part of your study. Um, if you can really learn the jazz language as you're mastering your instrument, I think that's ideal. Some people disagree with that. They want people to master their instrument and then learn jazz. But to me, it, you, you have to unlearn things in that case in order to learn jazz. Well, if you make it all part of the same process, it's a little bit like people who grew up bilingual. You know, They learn two different accents, two different ways of making sounds um, verbally as they grow up. And it, and it just they sort of take it for granted. That would be ideal for us as instrumentalists too, right? So, getting back to where it was, you know, make sure you're, you're spending 
a, a fair amount of time thinking about how to practice your instrumental technique. And of course, not just a technique. This idea we mentioned earlier of modeling, you know, listen to as much music as you possibly can. Now, one of the problems a lot of band students in high school especially face is that, you know, they got their instrument, their clarinet or trumpet or saxophone or whatever, um, and it doesn't really fit into the music that they're checking out, whether it's pop or hip hop or, or rock or some other genre that's more of a, a vernacular genre. Um, look, there's no reason why there's that separation should be there. If you have songs that you really like, it doesn't matter if it's band music or classical music or jazz or whatever, there's no reason why you can't learn those songs on your instrument. It's a great way to practice. You're developing ear, you're learning the song that you find interesting, so it's good for your musicianship, and it's good for your overall instrumental technique too, because this is you're getting this great connect, you're developing this connection between sort of the mind's ear, what you can hear, and what you can execute, and this is this is crucial, right? So, along with that, though, is it, it can mean expanding your listening. If you're a trumpet player, if you want to get good, man, you got to listen to great trumpet players. These days, you see, even just get it on YouTube. Plug in someone you know, Winton, uh, uh, Allison Balsam, Ingrid Jensen, any, any great trumpet player that comes to mind. Check out what they're doing, and then see what other videos come up that are recommended. And when you listen though, as I mentioned, you need to listen to real details. If you just notice like, wow, they sound great. Um, okay, that's a nice observation. But if you're trying to become a great player yourself and if your only observation is, well, they sound great and I don't, that's not very useful, is it? So get into those details. What is it about their sound, their articulation, uh, their sense of line, if they're a jazz player, what is it about how they improvise? What is it about the lines they play, the notes they choose, the way they phrase that pulls you in, that you like? Your opinion counts here, right? You shouldn't just be saying, well, you know, tell me what to do, tell me what's good. Even if you're not very well informed yet, if you're not that well experienced, something based on your past musical experiences is going to grab you. And that's worth listening to, that's worth paying attention to. And your taste and your interest and your understanding of the music will continue to evolve. It never stops. You know, I'm, I'm an old guy, I'm going to be 52 in a, in a few weeks, and I'm still learning something every day, often for my own students. So it's, it's a two-way street, you know. Um, that learning process never ends. But you got to make sure you're, you're aiming for it, you're pursuing it. Otherwise, you might end up letting things wash over you and missing an opportunity to, to take in lots of great information. So anyway, I, I hope this has been helpful. Uh, certainly in this stage of a clinic, normally in person, we, we have a chance to do some questions and answers. And so I'm, I've tried to address any questions that I anticipate might have come up had we been able to do this in person. Feel free to reach out to me if you like. The easiest way to reach me is by email, rex at rexrichardson.net. Uh, you can also find me on social media. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I'm on, um, what else? I'm not doing TikTok yet, maybe at some point. <laughs> and I've got all these videos on, on uh, YouTube as well that I'm hoping you, you might find interesting. And um, feel free to reach out. The other thing I should point out to you is don't be afraid to reach out to any musician that you admire. You know, trumpet players, they see someone like Wayne Bergeron or Alan Mazzuti, these guys are superstars, you know. These guys are really good people, too. And they really like talking to students. They really get inspired by students who are inspired by, who are, who are excited about the music. And they'll talk to you. They'll share the knowledge. You know, these are nice people. They're not some sort of standoffish celebrities that don't want to, don't want to deal with other uh, people or deal with younger students, you know. So you should always, when in doubt, always reach out. The, the worst thing that's going to happen sometimes, maybe you won't get a response, but you're almost never going to get some kind of a rude response if you reach out politely and professionally and ask about getting a lesson or ask for a point of advice. You should always feel free to do that. So I hope we get a chance to be together in person. And once again, if you have any questions about any of these issues that have been brought up in this video, I hope you won't hesitate to reach out to me. And um, everybody stay safe and stay healthy. Hope to see you soon.